Welcome to the UT Health East Texas Virtual Education Series. Today's presentation topic is Chronic Knee Pain, Causes and Treatment featuring Dr. Clayton Hodges, Board Certified Orthopedic Sports Medicine Surgeon at UT Health East Texas Orthopedic Institute. Today we're going to focus on chronic knee pain. This is a very common problem in the young and the adult population and we're going to try and make it a little more understandable, make it a little clearer and talk about some common problems and treatments of those problems. So first we'll go over a brief outline of the presentation. We're going to talk about structural anatomy, try and get an idea of the structures we're talking about and then dive deeper into some of the problems that can occur and how we address those problems. We're going to cover structural anatomy, we're going to cover ligamentous injuries of the knee, meniscal injury, cartilage injury, and finally arthritis, one of the most prevalent problems we face and issues we deal with. Discussing knee anatomy, we're going to talk about bony anatomy, and the knee joint is comprised of two articulations, or two joints, the joint between the femur, which is the thigh bone, and the tibia, which is the shin bone, as well as the patella, and the patella, the kneecap, articulates or interacts with the end of the femur, and creates kind of the third surface within the knee that has an articulation. We're going to talk about cartilage. Cartilage is a smooth covering at the end of the bones that allows for frictionless motion. Um, this is tough tissue, but it has a poor ability to regenerate and heal, and that causes some of the issues we face with chronic knee pain. We're going to talk about ligaments, which are critical for knee stability. These are essentially the structures in the knee that prevent it from having abnormal or pathologic motion. And we're going to talk about the menisci. These are tough cartilage wedges that are in between the femur and the tibia, provide shock absorption and other qualities that are really critical for knee function. So to start with knee ligament injuries, we're looking primarily at four ligaments in the knee. The first is the medial collateral ligament. This is the most commonly injured and rarely require surgery because it is outside of the knee joint proper. It has the capacity to heal. When we talk about the ligaments within the knee joint, we're talking about the anterior cruciate ligament and the posterior cruciate ligament, and you can see those on the diagram just below the kneecap. These ligaments, unfortunately, cannot heal because they are within the joint and they're bathed in joint fluid, which really compromises their ability to heal. Subsequently, ACL injuries are the most common ligament injuries which require surgery. And everyone's heard of famous athletes and I'm sure people you know who've had to have their ACL ligaments reconstructed. We're also going to talk less about the lateral collateral ligament. You can see that's kind of the opposite side of the knee as the MCL and is probably one of the least commonly injured ligaments. When we talk about ligamentous injury, we talk about acute injuries that happen, and if we allow these injuries to become chronic, we can see subsequent damage to the knee. When the knee is unstable, meaning it's lost its ligamentous stability, the knee undergoes abnormal motion. And when that happens, we can have the meniscus tear, we can have cartilage wear out and tear and become thinner. And we can also see people avoiding activities that they would normally undertake, such as sports, pivoting activities, and even have discomfort or disability as far as normal activities go, just stepping off a curb, going up steps, walking on uneven ground. So this can be quite a problem for people if it's allowed to become chronic and really allows their knee to have abnormal motion. ACL injuries. Uh, since they're the most commonly operated on, we'll spend a little bit of time on those. They occur usually as non-contact injuries, and that means as you may have seen someone in a basketball game or a football um, game where they plant their foot and turn their body and their knee twists abnormally. It's generally not another player impacting their knee, but usually, as is graphically depicted in this picture of a rugby player, a real twisting moment on the knee which causes an injury to this ligament. You can see in the graphic on the slide as well that the ACL is situated in the middle of the knee and you see those arrows, the blue arrows pointing to the femur twisting one way and the tibia twisting another. Typically after an ACL injury what you'll see is rapid swelling of the knee. It'll fill up rather quickly and that's because an artery is actually injured when you tear your ACL and the inability to walk on it or not wanting to walk on it. Those signify significant injuries that should be tended to or evaluated in a timely basis. These are 
arthroscopic pictures, meaning we've put a camera inside the knee with water blowing the knee up so we can see these structures. And they're a little hard to understand or interpret, but if you look at the first picture on the left, you'll see a normal ACL. So this ligament is smooth. It looks like it has not had any injury to it. If you look at the picture on the right, you can see that's a dramatically different ACL. And that's what an ACL rupture looks like, where the ligament has frayed and become essentially non-functional. So ACL injuries need to be treated in people of kind of two varieties. One is people who plan to participate in pivoting sports. If you know your loves to play soccer, basketball, something where you plant your foot and twist your body, it's unlikely you're gonna be able to return to those without having your ACL reconstructed because it's really critical in order to um, participate in those types of activities. There are a subset of people who tear their ACL and have instability just with normal activity. Like I said before, stepping off a curb, walking on uneven ground. And in that case, even though you don't necessarily want to participate in pivoting sports, it's reasonable to have your ACL reconstructed because like we said, if you have pathologic movement of the knee, that leads to secondary problems, meniscus tears, cartilage injury, and things that we don't want to be dealing with down the road. Like I talked about previously, MCL injuries are frequently treated without surgery, typically six to eight weeks in a brace, and those will turn out just fine. ACL reconstruction, this next slide is arthroscopic images again depicting the before and after. So we see the injured ACL on the left, and typically to reconstruct an ACL, like I said before, we can't, those ligaments typically won't heal because they are intraarticular. They're bathed in joint fluid, so they won't heal like an MCL tear would. And so we have to make a new ACL for the patient. And we typically do that by taking a tendon either from someplace else near their knee or using allograft tissue. And you see that central structure on the slide on the right showing a reconstructed ACL. You can see it running from the lower right to the upper left of the picture, going from the tibia to the femur and restoring that function of an ACL to give stability to the knee again. When we have chronic ACL insufficiency, we see increased frequency of meniscus tear, specifically the medial meniscus. So we'll talk a little bit about meniscal anatomy, and I've included some pictures here to try and give you an idea of what that is, because it's sort of a nebulous concept. But essentially there are two menisci in each knee. There's one in the inner part of the knee or the medial part of the knee, we call the medial meniscus. The outer part of the knee or the lateral part of the knee, we call the lateral meniscus. The menisci are semicircular wedges, and what they really do is they transmit load from a spherical or circular bone, the femur, to a flat bone, the tibia. If you don't have a meniscus wedged in between those bones, you have far higher contact pressures because less of the femur is touching the tibia. So that cartilage tends to get really overloaded, and in fact, we see that when people have their meniscus removed, as was done 40 years ago, they would go on to develop arthritis or loss of cartilage rather quickly, within a decade or so. Um, so the menisci function is shock absorbers, for lack of a better term, but really to distribute pressure evenly throughout the knee joint. And when you're missing part of your meniscus or it's torn, that can cause symptoms, and long term, it can cause increased pressures on the cartilage, which can cause the, the development of arthritis. The meniscus, because it sees such huge loads when you're walking, jumping, running across the knee joint, it doesn't have a very good blood supply. If it had large blood vessels within it, those blood vessels would be crushed. So by necessity, the meniscus is rather avascular, which means it has a very limited ability to heal on its own. Once you tear the meniscus, it's not likely that that's gonna heal and it's almost unheard of. So typically, it, a symptomatic meniscus tear may require some intervention by a surgeon. So again, the meniscus function, this I think slide demonstrates well what the meniscus does. And if you look at the top picture, you see the femur pushing down on the tibia and the meniscus in between the two really distributing that load across the knee joint rather than in the picture on the bottom. If you didn't have a meniscus, just imagine you would only have central contact between those two bones and quite a bit of overload. When we look at meniscus injuries, um, these are common injuries, but not all of them are symptomatic. It depends a lot on the location of the tear, which meniscus it's in, and the activity level of the patient. Um, like I said before, they can happen with acute injury. Say, when you tear your ACL, you may tear your lateral meniscus or medial meniscus, but if you have constant ligamentous laxity, you can have meniscus tears that we call attritional or happen over time. When you have arthritis and you have abnormal cartilage, that can kind of abrade the meniscus and cause tears that are a little bit different than the, the previous two types of meniscus tears I mentioned. 
When we talk about meniscus tears, the symptoms we think of are um, sharp pain in the knee on one side or the other, the medial side or inner part of the knee or the lateral side or the outer part of the knee with twisting, bending deeply on the knee, or heavy activity. In severe cases, you can actually see or feel the knee catching or sticking or locking, and that's if a piece of the meniscus is torn free and is moving around between the femur and the tibia bone and getting caught as those two are moving past each other. And that's something we want to evaluate quickly because if you've lost knee range of motion for a long period of time, that can cause stiffness and other issues down the line. So this is a couple of more arthroscopic injury uh, images talking about treatment of meniscus injuries. So the upper uh, picture, we see a normal meniscus, and it's that tissue interposed between the femur, which is above, and the tibia below, and you see that nice sheet of tissue in between. That's a normal appearing meniscus. When you look at the picture on the lower left, what you see is a flap of tissue that's come out from under that meniscus, and that's a meniscal tear. Now you can imagine that that torn piece of tissue between the femur and the tibia could cause symptoms. As you're walking and as those two bones slide past each other, if that fragment gets caught in between the two bones, you get a sharp jolt of pain and you can get a sensation of popping or catching within the knee. The lower right picture is the treatment and that's to trim out the torn segment um, of this area of the meniscus which has zero blood flow and almost no chance of healing. Now, if we see meniscus tears in a little bit different location that are caused by acute injury or ligament instability, and there's not significant arthritis, we think about repairing the meniscus because we want to preserve the long-term health of the knee, and we know that meniscus preserves the cartilage in the long term. So that upper picture, you see a tear in the meniscus that's a bit farther back, and it's not a flap. It's a, what we call a vertical tear through and through the meniscus. And then the lower picture, you see sutures going across that tear, which will hopefully repair it. The success rate is fairly good with ACL reconstruction and good with out ACL reconstruction. It's not always a sure bet, but it's something we always try to preserve in someone with normal cartilage because it is so important to the long-term health of the knee. So without meniscus, we get cartilage injury um, and we can get cartilage injury in isolation. We'll talk about um, you know, the different types of cartilage injury, and there's a wide variety and a, a huge spectrum of this. So the pictures I've included here is more like a cartilage injury you'd see with an acute injury, where a chunk of the cartilage has been knocked out rather than kind of a broad-based, large change in the cartilage overall in the knee. Um, it's usually, like I said, an isolated lesion um, and happens acutely, whereas widespread damage is more likely to be attritional over time and associated with the development of arthritis. So what do we see in cartilage injuries? In the acute injuries, we may see swelling within the knee. If that chunk of cartilage has broken off of the surface and is floating freely within the knee, you can see locking or catching in the knee. Again, the same mechanism as the meniscus where you have this free piece of tissue that gets caught in between the tibia and the femur as they slide past each other. Um, and persistent pain can also be a feature of this. This picture illustrating a joint effusion, which is swelling within the knee joint itself in comparison to the normal knee of the patient on the contralateral side or the other side. So the treatment options for cartilage injury in the acute setting, um, we can talk about addressing it, especially if there's locking or catching. Um, if it's more of a chronic problem, we have knee injections, which can be very helpful in decreasing inflammation, getting rid of the effusion and seeing if we can get the knee to calm down. Bracing to offload the lesion if you have the cartilage lesion in either the medial or lateral compartment, there are certain types of braces we can use to try and take the load, the body weight off of that area of the knee and see if we can get the symptoms to calm down. Therapy is a step we can take with almost any knee injury or problem is a first step or an initial step. Um, if these fail or if it's a, a particularly discrete lesion in a young patient, um, we can think about restoring the cartilage. And there are some, are some exciting techniques for doing that these days where we actually take your cartilage cells, grow them up in a lab, multiply them, and then place them back in the knee at a later time. And those have shown good results in the long term for bringing cartilage health back to that area of the knee. That's called aut autologous chondrocyte implantation, which is a bit of a mouthful, but it's a good surgery. So now on to knee arthritis. So this is a huge problem in America and worldwide. It causes a massive amount of decreased quality of life, decreased economic income, and a myriad of other problems. The, it's almost incomprehensible. The estimates that I've seen from the early 2010s are $100 billion yearly 
and loss of revenue and cost of treatment as far as knee arthritis. So this is a huge problem that we face and you know it's a really a challenge to deal with in some ways because we're living longer and maybe the knee was not designed to live past 80 or 90 years in a healthy way and people want to stay active longer which is great and our goal for all of our patients is to stay as active and do what they want to do late into life but the challenge is how do we get them there. So the symptoms of knee arthritis um, and these are kind of distinct typically knee arthritis patients will wake up and their knees feeling the best it's going to feel all day the more they walk and the more they do that day the worse the knee pain gets. Um, you may see swelling in the knee which is either comes and goes or is pretty consistent and constant and that can develop into other problems in the knee. If you've heard of a Baker cyst, that's swelling that can develop in the back of the knee as a result of persistent knee swelling. Um, stiffness early on is a characteristic of arthritis until the knee, for lack of a better term, gets loosened up. Um, and then deformity in the knee um, is something we see as arthritis really advances. And if we look at the pictures, we can see a normal joint with normal joint space between the femur and the tibia. And then on the right, we see that that joint space has been obliterated. And the correlate of that is if you see this patient's legs, they've become quite bow-legged, or we would say their knee is in varus. And that's because the joint space medially is gone, the cartilage is gone, and the bones are rubbing on bone. To delve a little deeper into what arthritis actually is and what causes it, um, the wear of cartilage is the key factor of developing arthritis. That's the driver, right? And as we get about thinking about what causes wear, there's really two factors. What does the surface look like? How smooth is the surface? And what is the load on that surface? So the smoothness of the surface, say you had an acute injury like I'd showed before in an ACL injury where a chunk of cartilage had been knocked off the femur. If that abnormal femur is now rubbing against a normal tibia, over time it's gonna wear that tibia and make the cartilage abnormal on that side. So that is one mechanism for it. You have a small injury in the cartilage, but over time it abrades or wears the surface opposite it and you get this vicious circle where now you're getting more and more irregular surfaces rubbing against each other and they're just continuing to wear. And in a lot of ways, that's why arthritis never gets better on radiographs, it only progresses, because once there's an area of wear in the knee, that's always gonna increase. The other big factor is what's the load across the surface. So if the surface is seeing a load of 100 pounds, it's gonna wear much more slowly than if it's seeing a, a, a load of 200 pounds. And that's another big factor that we can talk about in the development of arthritis and prevention or improvement of the symptoms. So when we talk about prevention, um, how do we slow or arrest cartilage wear? Okay, so maintain smooth cartilage. We can't avoid acute injuries. We wanna be active, do what we wanna do, injuries happen. We can restore or address the cartilage defects in a timely fashion if they happen in an otherwise normal knee. Um, and that's an important part of it. The other part of it is to decrease the load. So like we, I talked about before, bracing to offload the disease part of the knee actually is fairly successful, although wearing a knee brace in perpetuity is not ideal. Um, the other thing we can do is to preserve the meniscus, which decreases the load by expanding the surface area that the, the tibia and the femur have to interact. And then making sure we're at a healthy weight is also important because as I'll show in a, in a, a future slide, the load distribution in the knee is a little counterintuitive. It's actually much higher than your body weight. So small changes in weight can have a huge impact on the load on your knee. And that's really, I think, something that's important for patients to understand as they manage their symptoms and deal with knee arthritis. So this is a, a, a peer-reviewed journal, a study, and it shows kind of the surprising amount of load that's placed on the knee relative to one's body weight. So if we look at 10 pounds of weight loss, we'll take about 40 pounds of load off of the knee. So in other words, I'm about 220 pounds. That means with every step on even ground, my knee sees a load of 880 pounds. If I lost even 20 pounds, I would take 80 pounds off my knee, which could be a significant difference. So I think, you know, there are some, and understandably so, when, when you think about, I need to lose a significant amount of weight to improve my knee symptoms, that's not actually necessarily true. Even small changes in your weight in the right direction can make a big multiplicative exponential effect on the load your knee is seeing and hopefully your symptoms of arthritis. So when we talk about the treatment of arthritis, well, there's numerous treatments that are shown to be effective um, and shown to really improve people's quality of life short of surgery. 
So weight loss, we talked about that. That's probably the single most important thing any of us can do to improve the health or the, the symptoms in our knee. Um, low impact activity, avoiding high impact activity such as running, jumping, alternatively doing elliptical or stationary bike, swimming, walking, those are all better alternatives and they decrease the load on your knee, decrease that wear rate on the car cartilage and hopefully prolong the health of your knee. Physical therapy has actually shown improvements by strengthening the knee and increasing that stability, preventing abnormal motion through some dynamic stabilizers of the knee. And as especially with the patellofemoral or the kneecap arthritis pain is, is usually quite successful. We talk about NSAIDs, these are a no-brainer and everyone's tried these who's had knee pain. Um, bracing, like we talked about, the offloader brace is also an option if the arthritis is really only in one compartment of the knee or localized to one part of the knee. And then injections are probably the most powerful thing we have when people get, or patients get into an acute exacerbation. You come in with a swollen knee, extremely painful, really limiting you. A steroid injection can be wonderful the first time. The unfortunate thing is, Typically, every steroid injection lessens in its effect and duration. The first steroid injection can last months. The next one may only last weeks, and eventually they become ineffective. We have another set of injections that we've tried and have been shown to be successful in a significant amount of patients called visco supplementation. And those are really a natural component of normal knee fluid that we put into an arthritic knee. Arthritic knees tend to have much thinner, less lubricative fluid because they're inflamed. Putting some normal components back in there makes the knee feel better in a significant proportion of the patients. So surgical treatment, um, it used to be highly in favor before about 2006 when the Journal of the American Medical Association came out with a study showing that long-term arthroscopic surgery for arthritis that's close to bone on bone or bone on bone just isn't there. It's not beneficial unless there are a couple discrete caveats to that. If there's a loose body, like in the picture on the bottom, where there's a, uh, essentially your body has created a pearl out of a piece of cartilage that's broken off and you've got this thing moving around your knee that's catching or sticking, getting that out can sometimes create a significant amount of relief. Otherwise, there's not a, a very big role for arthroscopy in degenerative arthritis um, as far as treatment goes and long-term improvement. The slide that we're looking at at the top, you see the left, which is a normal knee, and then on the right, you see an arthritic knee. And you can see there's widespread cartilage loss, there's exposed bone, and you can see the meniscus has really been chewed away. You can see that meniscus between the femur and the tibia on the left looks pristine like a nice sheet of tissue. And on the right, that meniscus has really been degraded by being squeezed between these two abnormal bony surfaces. So talking about further surgical treatment besides arthroscopy in the same sort of understanding of the offloader brace, the disease compartment of the knee, and we can see in this slide, you look at the slide on the upper left, a normal knee, and then the slide on the upper right, and a knee that has really focal arthritis, where the medial side of the knee is bone on bone, but the, other, the lateral side of the knee actually looks quite good. In these situations, you can realign the tibia to take the load off of that diseased part of the, the tibia and transfer more of the load to the more normal appearing lateral side of the tibia. It's called a high tibial osteotomy. And this is not done frequently, but in specialized cases, it can be considered for someone with relatively healthy knee otherwise, and definitely maybe too young for a knee replacement, this is a good option. So we're looking again at this procedure and you can see the alignment of the knee changing and getting if you look at that center line drawn from the hip to the ankle, you can see before surgery on the far left and after surgery how you've transferred the load to the lateral aspect of the knee. This procedure does take about six weeks of non-weight bearing and it requires three to five months before returning to full activity. So that's quite an investment, but for many patients this can be quite successful. Another option is a partial knee replacement. This is replacing the worn part of the knee with metal and plastic. A full knee replacement would be replacing the entire knee and all its articular interactions with metal and plastic. This is just one specific part. The benefits of this over the realignment procedure is you can weight bear on it immediately. You don't have that six weeks on crutches. You don't have three to five months of limited activity. Although we know that these may not last indefinitely and there is a chance that the rest of your knee over time deteriorates and we're talking decades and you may need a full knee replacement after that. 
Going into a summary of this, consider surgery when non-operative treatment has failed, and we have extensive means to non-operative treatment, but at some point, it's just not working and surgery needs to be undertaken. So if you have limited cartilage damage in one compartment, um, looking at the age and activity level of the patient and what they want to participate in post-operatively, we think about realignment procedures being a good option. We think about uh, partial knee replacements in people who are maybe not wanting as high activity level and they want a, a quicker rehab and less restrictions post-operatively. And then total knee replacement, we would prefer to do it on people as they go past 60 and 65 because we only want people to have one surgery. We know that the survival rate for a knee replacement, meaning the components stay in the knee of patients over hundreds of thousands studied, really starts to dip off after about 20 years. And that can be due to problems that happen with the plastic wearing out or loosening of the other components or other issues with the knee. But if, if we do the knee replacement as someone turns 65, 70, we know, we're, we know they're likely not to need another surgery. However, much younger patients, 45, 50, a total knee replacement at that age, there's a good chance that they're gonna need another bigger revision surgery later in life, which we'd like to avoid if possible. Here are a few questions that we've received, and I'll read them off in order. Do I need a knee replacement if I have knee arthritis? Well, that's a complicated question. I would say that you need a knee replacement if your quality of life has suffered to the point where you live your life based around your knee symptoms. And this is a common conversation I have with patients. We have a lot of different treatment options before knee replacement is necessary. And I would say most orthopedic surgeons say that their patients tell them when they need a knee replacement. The surgeon does not tell the patient they need a knee replacement. So if, what I generally tell my patients is, if you're you planning your day and you say, I have three things to do today. I have to go to the store, I have to go register my car, and I have to go volunteer after work or whatever it may be. But you say, I can only do one or two of those things because my knee's gonna hurt too bad to do the third. It's probably time to consider a knee replacement. I know that's a difficult way to judge, but in your own mind, if you're living your life based around your knee pain, and we've tried these other things, physical therapy, anti-inflammatory drugs, bracing, steroid injections, visco supplementation, and it's just not working anymore. That's when I'd say it's time to really strongly consider a knee replacement. The next question is, uh, how much will knee replacement reduce my pain? Quite a bit. There is great literature showing that knee replacements are a fantastic surgery. They improve people's quality of life but they do have risks. And so you're trading that improvement in quality of life for rare but serious risks. And that's why we don't do them willy nilly. And it really needs to be a commitment from the patient and the surgeon that post-operative rehab is gonna be undertaken and really work on getting the knee replacement to turn out as, as well as it can. But it should not be looked at as a minor procedure or something to be undertaken lightly. It's really something that needs to be t undertaken with serious attention to the possible rare complications and that you've come to the understanding that the benefits of having to be relieved of that constant drain of thinking about your knee pain is going to be gone. How do you know if knee pain is serious? Well, there's a couple key things I would say with that. Number one, if your motion of your knee has become abnormal, if you can't fully straighten your knee and that happens acutely during an injury, that's concerning and we want to see you sooner rather than later. Don't just try to walk that off. If you're going weeks and weeks after an injury and you can't get your knee fully straight or you can't bend it fully, that's something concerning that we want to know about. Um, as far as whether knee pain is serious, if you're, if you're feeling events where you feel your knee gives way on you. It's moving pathologically. It's moving in a way it didn't previously move. That can be an idea that you're having some ligamentous instability or you had a ligamentous injury. And that's important to understand and recognize that that needs to be evaluated. Another key thing with knee injuries is if you had a really hard time putting weight on your knee after an injury, say you injured your knee playing a sport or you had a fall and you tried to stand up and you couldn't, that's a good reason to go get x-rays, make sure that nothing has been fractured in the knee and then probably have somebody evaluate whether you injured a ligament or, or something else in there. That's a real red flag if you're not able to put your weight on your knee right afterwards. And like we talked about earlier with the ACL, if you see rapid swelling within the knee, within the first couple hours after an injury, that's another red flag that you wanna take seriously. 
Again, I'm Clayton Hodges, orthopedic surgeon at UT Health East Texas, specializing in sports medicine. I really appreciate your attention and time. We hope you enjoyed the presentation today. If you would like to schedule an appointment with Dr. Hodges, please call 903-596-3844 or visit UTHealthEastTexasDoctors.com. Our next virtual seminar will be announced soon. Follow us on Facebook to stay up to date on upcoming events and seminars. Thank you for joining.